I'm going to ask now if people can throw out some of the thoughts that they, they had in that discussion. Throw out a few words, whatever came up while you were you talking. Anybody? Communication. Anything else? What makes a community healthy? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Square. Excellent. Lovely, yes. Fulfilling employment, and that, you know, there's no wrong answers. It's just neat to see what people come out with. Yes, definitely. Other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Beautiful. A library. Yes, <laughs> that's the number one requirement of a healthy community. <laughs> Community gardens, beautiful. So I'm gonna come back to some of these thoughts later on and we're gonna have opportunities later for more discussion because I know there's, there were other conversations happening there that, that we could draw upon. So kind of going into what I wanted to, to cover over the next 20-ish or so minutes, you can go to the next slide. I have only four slides and one of them, two of them have my son on them. So <laughs> it's, it's not a lot of detail, but I first wanted to actually acknowledge kind of the role ideas played in me moving here a year ago because people always ask me, you know, why did you come to Cape Breton? Because it's, you know, I think somewhat unusual for people to be moving here. And I had never planned on moving here. I was on a maternity leave from a previous job in Saskatchewan. I was still employed there at that time. And at the end of my mat leave, I was running out of money, wanted to work somewhere interesting for a few weeks. And someone suggested coming here because they were recruiting for my position. And normally you can't do short-term public health work, but because they really wanted to try to find someone, they said, sure, come, even though we know you're not looking for a job, come for a few weeks. And I had, before I came, looked up local food issues in Cape Breton and of course came up with Alicia Lake who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight but I met her the day she was hosting ideas so after I met her she said oh there's this talk tonight would you want to come to it and I said can I bring my son she said of course you can bring your son so that evening I came to an event where I heard wonderful speakers I met all kinds of interesting people my son got to dance and it was just a beautiful experience and I can't say that's the entire reason and I came to Cape Breton, but after three weeks, I looked at two houses, I bought one, and then told the person I needed to tell that I wanted the job, and he was surprised and a little horrified because they weren't ready to, to give the job to someone quite yet, but we had it all worked out. I left Saskatchewan, and a month later, I drove from Ontario with my son, and, and we moved here, and, and thinking about that experience of why I, I came here, I. I found the, the phrase that was used at that ideas night and the ones I've come to since, the idea of changing the narrative really resonated with me because the narrative that I saw during those three weeks and the years since I've been here really kind of attracted me here, that it's so many people here who are trying to, to change things for the better, knowing that there's, there's many different challenges, economic challenges, social challenges, but there's many people who are working really hard to make our, I think of it in terms of health, so health as individuals, health as communities, better. And that kind of leads me into the, the type of, of work that I do as a, as a physician, as a medical officer of health, because it's the type of work I do every day and what kind of makes me passionate is the fact that what I do in my spare time as well as what I do in my work really connect together and I just love that, that I don't have to really separate that and I know that's, you know, uh, not everyone can have that, that luxury of really loving what they do all the time, being able to include their family, having it all connected. This I consider, you know, part of my work even though, you know, it's not part of my work day. So, um, that idea that a physician isn't seeing patients, I find sometimes difficult to, to convey because people always ask me, you know, why don't you practice medicine? And I want to say, I spent 10 years studying <laughs> to do what I do, and I practice medicine every day, but I do see patients. I am also a family doctor, but that's a small part of my work. And then the rest of the time, it's about working with individuals and communities to, to help promote health in, in different ways. And the healthcare part of it, the role that doctors and nurses and hospitals play is really important, really vital, but is just one relatively small part of what makes us all healthy. And kind of tying that back to how 
I came to be doing public health. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about myself, but I think it connects into a bigger picture of health. Not yet. <laughs> um, like, not all of us, but many of us, I had immigrant parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, but it was my parents who came from India to Canada with the, the whole idea of making lives better for their, their children and their families. And my mother decided long ago that I would be a doctor. There was just no, no question. And I didn't really argue with my mother because you just don't argue with my mother. And until I got to high school and started really enjoying kind of history, English, philosophy, as well as all the science subjects, it took a, a high school teacher there to say something which I think doesn't always get said now, which is unfortunate because we don't value a lot of the skills that come with a liberal arts degree. But she said, you know, you really should do a liberal arts degree. And I hadn't really thought about doing that because I was going to go into sciences, but I took her advice and I went to a, a program at McMaster University in Ontario. And it's called Arts and Science, but it's this little kind of unique program where every subject integrates the arts and the science. You're not taking an, an art subject here and a science subject there, their philosophy is that you just can't separate them. And I was thinking Nicole had sent a, um, a link to another TED talk yesterday of uh, an 11 year old who's kind of learning through all these different routes and he was talking about physics and, and the creative way in which he's learning about physics. And that made me think of my, my physics class and that, that program because we were you know, putting on plays, we were learning about explorers, we were writing essays. and. We were also learning the equations and learning the theories. And so by the end of the year, you came out with this total wonder about the world that it all fits together, space and time and forces and how we all interact together and with our world. And, and to me, that was this beautiful feeling of just how you combine arts and science into to any subject. And I also at that time met some wonderful doctors in, this is in Hamilton, Ontario, some very socially conscious activist, amazing doctors involved in a group called Physicians for Global Survival. And they do a lot of work around nuclear weapons and, well, anti-nuclear weapons and um, nonviolent conflict resolution and prevention of war. And so I, I came to know this wonderful group who really inspired me. I, I was able to do my thesis on, on the feminist movement and the peace movement and how they interact. And after all that, I decided, you know, I did want to do medicine. My mother is right. You can do all these really fascinating things with medicine. And so I got into medicine, which I was happy about, but then, then I got there and I was miserable. Medicine, it was, you know, someone just droning at the front of the class. You had to memorize, you had to spew things out. I didn't have a science background. It was, it was really not a pleasant time. I failed my first term. I was ready to drop out. And then I met kind of the next person, as I think often you do, who motivates you and gives you a new way to look at things. And that next person was another physician. Her, her name's Jackie, and she's a, a hematologist and a doctor who specializes in blood and a historian of medicine. And, and she, I just, I remember, well, the story I wanted to tell is about her, one of her first classes. And she had put the, the QRS complex, so the, the heart wave that you know that's you know a squiggle across a page. And, and she had played this classical music and she had this heart wave pul pulsing across the screen and really trying to convey to us this beauty of our body and our heart and how it all works. And I love that story and I've been carrying it with me and thinking about stories. I emailed her today to say, what was the, the music you played with that? And she wrote back and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never did that. And I feel a little crushed because that was part of my talk. And I was all ready to tell that story. And I don't know where it came from now because it's really <laughs> influenced me through the years. And she suggested a few other people who might have done this. So I emailed them all today, say, really, please tell me that, that you did this in your class. But I think I might have made it all up. But <laughs> it contributed to my love of medicine maybe now retrospectively. But those kinds of real and made up experiences led me into public health because it was a specialty where you combine kind of social activism and medicine and bring it all together with this you know, knowledge of how the body works with this knowledge of, of how the world works and try to put it all together. But kind of away from me, kind of back to you because I, I 
now know a lot of people in this room and know the kind of work that you're, you're all doing and know that what I do is, a, again, a very tiny part of health because I know some of the work that some of you are doing, which is incredibly connected to health. And I was thinking about that in the last election in particular because when you look at election polls, kind of any time, health and health care is usually one of the top things people list. But what do they mean when they're listing that? I think they're, they're thinking in terms of hospitals and doctors, but I think what people are trying to say is, is we just, we want to be healthy, we want to be happy, we want to enjoy our lives, enjoy our families, enjoy where, I, where we live, and we connect that with health care because we think that can help solve that. And it, it can solve part of it, but really it's, it's much farther beyond that. And you pretty much quoted the WHO definition of health, which is this idea of health as a, a physical, spiritual, mental well-being and not just you know, not having a disease or not having infirmity. And that's kind of this well-known definition that it's, it's a bigger sense of health that's really important to, to all of us. And so the idea that I wanted to, to put forward, kind of connected to what to Ian was saying too, is that we're all connected through health, that I think if we use that kind of lens, health in a, in a broad sense, we'd all see how we all work together and how we're all responsible for health. It's not just the health authority, it's not just the, the doctors, it's all of us together. And that if we could do that in a really more organized way, in terms of partnerships and seeing how we can all be striving for a common goal together as, a, as community members, as community organizations, we'd have a better way to be able to achieve those goals instead of being fragmented, which happens often. Okay, next slide now. So this kind of speaks to that idea and I use this diagram often to try to explain how we're influenced by all these different factors, how they influence our health. So this middle circle is the things that, for the most part, we can't change about our health. Not, that's not a total um, a statement that can't be changed. Sex can be sometimes changed, but in general, age and sex and constitutional factors. Those are things that are kind of built into us that will influence our health that we can't change. And then the next layer are the choices we make every day, because every day we're making decisions about what we eat, whether we exercise, you know, how much you're going to sleep, all of those things are your, your choices every day. But then around those choices are all these other layers. So your, your housing, your, your health care is part of it, your education, your agriculture, food production, work conditions, employment. And all those things trickle down to whether you can make those choices every day. And so I think probably most people here would kind of understand that it's hard to eat healthy if you can't pay for that food or you don't have access to that food. Or it's hard to get a job if you couldn't get that education in the first place. So as much as it's, there is a, a responsibility as individuals, we know that all these other factors really influence what you can do as an individual. And then this is where I tend to bring in kind of my family medicine thoughts, because that is when you're interacting with people and you're hearing their, their stories every day. It's, it's a really neat job where you just sit and listen to people's stories and try to, try to work with them to deal with different issues. But yeah, the things a, a doctor hears and talks about, it, it's, it's a really special relationship that develops. But I'm going to tell a, a story that came from one of our public health nurses, because she it, it kind of connects the public health side and the patient side, and she works with clients who are hepatitis C positive, and she just speaks really eloquently about the, the people she works with. And she was talking about a client, and I'll just, I'll call him John, and he was diagnosed with hepatitis C in 2006, and he's kind of struggled through the years to kind of deal with that diagnosis. And he still, he was using injection drugs up until recently. He has had kind of several relationships. He has two children who he's not able to, to see. And that's kind of the surface story. But when you start to dig a bit deeper, you learn he's, he's only in his early 20s. He never finished high school. He's got a, a slight learning disability that, that impeded him. His parents struggled with addictions issues. He wasn't able to go to school all the time. He was taking care of his siblings. 
he didn't go to school because he couldn't afford clothes sometimes and just was too ashamed to go to school and the, and the clothes he was wearing. He, his brother started to use injection drugs, started to, to do tattooing, and John eventually got into alcohol and then injection drugs. And when his older brother was diagnosed with hepatitis C, he said to John, you, you should go get tested. And that's when he found out he was hepatitis C positive. And now he's you know, gone through the detox program. He's in a day program, really trying to stick with it. He doesn't live in Sydney. so taking public transit into Sydney every day to pick up methadone, which some of you might know is a really a challenging thing to get in and out by bus every day, but he's, he's working at it. And a story like his makes me think about how he's not, he is sick with hepatitis C, but he's also sick with lack of housing, lack of education, lack of social supports, all of those, those other pieces that have, have contributed to be in the, contributed to him being in the place where he is now, and kind of bringing it back from the individual up into you know, the bigger picture, I think something is important for all of us is that as a collective, we make decisions that influence each of us. We, it influences John, influences all of us in this room. And I wanted to acknowledge one resource that I've used a lot for this talk. It's a, a physician colleague, he's in Saskatchewan, and he wrote a book called A Healthy Democracy. And it's the same kind of idea of, of health as a lens with all the decisions we make. He puts it in the political context, how political decisions impact health, and really ties it to all of these areas, because all of these areas are influenced by all of us, but also very much by political decisions that trickle down to the, the individual and, and the, the choices that they're able to make in their life. And it's not just me kind of saying these things with nothing to back it up. We really know that if you have a higher income, if you have a better education, you're much more likely to be healthy. And it's across a whole spectrum. So it's not just kind of a rich, poor divide. All the way up this line, if you have slightly more income on the whole, you're likelier to be healthier. So it goes up a line all the way along a, a spectrum. And even more interestingly than that, we know that societies that are more equal tend to be healthier. So if you have this much wealth in one society, but it's a very unequal society, you're going to be less healthy than if it's a society where there is more equality. I hope I said that the right way. So that's another, it's another fantastic book if you ever wanted to look at it. It's called The Spirit Level and um, that idea that it benefits all of us to have a more equal society than if we can just take care of ourselves and be richer and not take care of other people. So it's this, I think, a profound concept that all of us benefit from all of us being healthy. But I think sometimes we tend to think in terms of not really our health, but you know, taking the economy for one example, which is often what people list as their number one or top priority around the, around jobs, around the economy, which is, of course, incredibly important. But I think sometimes we focus too much on the numbers and not so much how much is that benefiting us as a community. And just one number to throw out there that we know our, our GDP increased 30% in Canada from 1994 to 2008. But then there's a, an index called the Canadian Wellbeing Index, and that only increased by 10%. So it kind of leads to, you can analyze that a lot more, but it leads to questions around, is economic growth really benefiting us as a society? So we need to look at how economic growth improves all of our health and isn't just the outcome on its own without looking at how we all benefit. And Nicole had, had posted this quote, which I, I really like, that kind of captures that idea. It's a quote by Robert F. Kennedy, and he says, Gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder and chaotic sprawl. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, nor neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. 
It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. And to just kind of end, even though we might not all be using the word health or that language, when I've, what I've seen in Cape Breton over the last year is a lot of people working to make communities better. So I would say, oh, oh you know what? I forgot I had a, a few other slides. You can skip through those because I just kept going. Well, maybe I'll just mention this. So what this was, what I meant to say about this is that it's an order of impact. What has the most impact on our health? So number one is income status, is the number one contributor to our health. And you'll see that number nine is, is health services. But the top things are around early childhood development, education, social support. So we know that if we can address some of those earlier numbered items, that will be better for our health than, than some of the ones. They're all important, but those are the most important ones. And you can flip through. There's a few colors in there. And then one more. And next slide. So this is my last slide. And it's kind of ending with this idea of all of us being involved in health. So I would say that you know, Cape Breton Fiddler's Run is about health, promoting activity through the island. I'd say New Dawn's work is about health with, with this discussion and the other work they do around housing, around supporting a creative economy. It's, I just came from the CBRM Youth Focus Council. It's work around youth issues, other organizations like Community Cares and Association for Safer Cape Breton. They're also doing a lot around youth issues, which, which is connected to health. Say it's Victoria County focusing on housing, it's Inverness County looking at food security, it's the whole kind of food movement that's happening in Cape Breton. Um, it's Ecology Action Center looking at climate change, it's all of these things that are all connected to our health. So I'll just end with kind of saying this, repeating this idea, which I think I've said about 10 times now, that health is much bigger than just, just health care and health belongs to all of us and that if we can find a way to kind of harness our energy together to, to achieve common goals, we're more likely to have, a, have healthier communities. Thank you.